Amy Lee Mercury, and I'm so excited to be here today with Patricia Levy. Hi, Patricia. Hi, Amy. Patricia Levy is a PhD, best-selling author, women's studies expert, and an internationally recognized leader in arts based in qualitative research. She has published 18 books and is a regular fixture in the media. Her list of awards is lengthy and includes being the youngest recipient of the 2015 Special Career Award given by the International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry and the 2014 Special Achievement Award from the American Creativity Association. An examiner called her the High Priestess of Pop Feminism. What a title. I, I know, that, that one made me smile, I have to say that. I hope I can live up to it. I think you already have. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm so thrilled to speak with you. I'm so excited that we get to talk. You're, you're a colleague, a friend who I admire, but also someone who I really respect for all the work that you do. So it's really exciting when I get to talk to people like you. Thank you. So I was wondering what is the number one favorite part of your career? Well, I basically spend the majority of my time at home, alone, in my pajamas, in my office. Um, and I do have to say that working at home alone in your pajamas is sort of fantastic. Um, but, but really, you know, what I love about writing is the freedom of expression that I have. I think that freedom of expression is a gift that many are denied. Um, so I take that really seriously. So, for example, in February, I was at a conference in Austria. And there was a world-famous cartoonist, a political cartoonist there, um, who was giving an example of how he does his work. And he stopped at one point and said, you know, in some places in the world, I would be pulled out of this room and you would never see me again. Yeah. Um, and I think that's obviously true, that freedom of expression is very serious. And many people in our world are silenced, including within our own culture. So I have to say, I think that you know, the ability to share my thoughts, my ideas, my creativity, and to do so freely um, is a huge gift and probably the biggest blessing in my career. And, you know, a, a part of that also is that the writing process, and I know you're an author so you understand mm -hmm. this, is also healing. It's a way of processing what you believe, what others have told you, and really reinforcing it for yourself. So it's, it's cathartic, it's healing, and... Um, it's just something I feel very blessed to be able to do. I agree with all those points and I feel blessed too to get to share my ideas, write books, and it really does put in perspective for us that freedom of expression, how grateful we can be because we actually get to have that freedom. It's pretty amazing. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> So, um, I know you do a lot with arts-based research. Would you tell us a little bit more about what that is and why it's important? Absolutely. Thank you for asking. Um, arts-based research is when a researcher in any field, so it could be psychology, healthcare, sociology, what have you, uses a creative art or multiple creative arts as a way of doing their research or sharing their research with the public. So for example, you can have a group of people in the medical community who do a study on a certain topic and then instead of writing a boring journal article that only people in the medical community right. could read, they might write a play and put on a play that they could show in hospitals or community theater um, or some other public space. And the idea is that the public then has access to information they wouldn't have access to. Um, I don't know if you've ever read a peer-reviewed journal article, but they are like worse than your car manual. I mean, I would rather read a 100 you know, page insurance plan than read most peer-reviewed articles. And if you're not in that field and you don't have a PhD or MD in that field, you're not going to have access to those articles. You're not going to understand them. They're boring, they're dry, they're impossible to get. And I believe that people should have access to information, certainly information they want to have access to. So arts-based research is a way of doing it. It's a way of taking research that would only stay in one field 
and sharing it with people in the public and people in other fields in research academies. And um, the reason I really think it's important is because I think that the public has a right to information. I think that the work so many of us are doing, sociologists, anthropologists, psychologists, is of interest to people out there in the real world. And so we have to find ways. The onus is on us to find ways to get it out there. So if people want to engage with it, they have that opportunity. I love that, and I agree. And so your book, American Circumstance, would be an example of that, correct? Yes, exactly. Great, which I loved, by the way. Thank you so much. It means so much to me. I love Low Fat Love as well, but I really... I really enjoyed American Circumstance to the point, I think, where I told you either via email or in person, you could literally shop that as a novel and it would do well commercially because it's so well done. Thank you so much. I mean, that's the best compliment because the idea with arts-based research is that you do create good art out of it. Right. So it can't just be, you know, research and really shoddy art because then nobody's going to want to read it or go see it or view it anyway. So I really did work hard on that on that novel um, to make it the best novel I was capable of doing, even though it's informed by my research, even though it's informed by interviews I did with women for over a decade. And um, I have to say on a personal note, that novel is my favorite of my own books. Um, actually, I have a copy right here. Yeah. Folks want to see it. Um, and I have a copy of, we have a new version of Low Fat Love, which was my first Ooh. novel. This is an expanded anniversary edition, So, um, which I know is the, the first thing you have read of mine years yeah. back. But I really, I think that, you know, it's important to do your best. You know, I was not trained as a novelist. I was trained as a sociologist. Mm -hmm. So I was trained to interview people about their life experiences, to analyze and interpret those experiences. Mm -hmm. But I've taught myself rigorously over years as much as I can about the craft of writing fiction yeah. so that I could do what for me would be the best job with a novel. Yeah. And it really shows. Thank so, you. So social fiction, you have the social fiction series, American Circumstances, part of that, so is Low Fat Love, and many other titles as well, right? That's right. And so with social fiction, we would, tell us more about why we would want to read it, even as non-academics. Okay, well when I wrote my first novel, which was based on interview research, and that was Low Fat Love, I really wanted to publish it as research, mm -hmm. and it's really hard to do that. I mean, people expect you to publish it as a trade novel with a commercial press, but to me, this is research, mm -hmm. and anyone can read it, but it is research. So I found an academic publisher, mm -hmm. Sense Publishers, and I pitched the idea of not only my book, but I thought my book should fit into something larger. So I pitched the idea of a book series all fiction but informed by research and written by professors and professional researchers. So the series is called the Social Fiction Series. Um, so far we have 17 books out and we're, we're in our fifth year, 17 books, and we have plays, novels, short story collections, poetry collections. If people are interested, they could go to sensepublishers.com. Uh, that's S-E-N-S-E -S -E publishers.com and they could look at all the titles. But the idea of social fictions is that you can write a good piece of fiction, a good play, a good novel, but that has actual information in it, that has moments that will hopefully prompt reflection, mm -hmm. that could teach something about social issues, social problems. So that's what all of the books in the series hopefully do. Um, and my, you know, my pitch to readers, my idea has always been that a book can be both a fun read and also have substance. And I, I think a lot of people are looking for that, something that is fun, they can read on an airplane or the beach, but that does give them food for thought, that does give them something to reflect on in their own lives, that does maybe jar them into thinking about a social issue from a new light. Um, and what I think about these books, the books by others in this series that I've read and what I hear from people, is that they can be empowering because people often see themselves reflected in the characters, in the situations, but there is real substance to the books so that they, they really have food for thought when they're done reading them. I agree, and I remember thinking that especially with Low Fat Love and with American Circumstance, how perhaps this is because you interviewed so many people, 
the characters were very well drawn and the character development was great but you could really see different aspects of oneself people in your life social issues you could really see that and it did inspire reflection and thought I, I think it's a really wonderful way to be entertained but also to kind of not necessarily foster critical thinking skills but just encourage those to be active which I think is so critical in our culture I really appreciate that I mean that's always been a goal and a hope and and I will say I've had countless women come up to me after reading either of the novels and say they could relate to characters in them it made them think about something in their own life a situation with a romantic partner a situation with a friend or a colleague and to me that's what I want to encourage people to to think about their own lives and also to think about the culture we live in so I have a lot of pop culture references, as I know you know, in both of the books. And part of it is to show, you know, we all live our lives in a context and in an environment that we have not just created in our own minds, and it impacts us. And um, I want to sensitize people to that just so they can make the best possible choices in their own life, which I know is something you write about, too, making choices from a place of empowerment. So that, that was really the goal with the books. I think it's it's being accomplished and it's pretty exciting. So I really recommend those, all of those books that I've read from the social fiction series. I've enjoyed them, and I'm excited to read some others. Actually, when I was looking at your website today and you know just thinking about what to ask you, there was one in there that stood out to me about xenophobia because I'm going to most likely be interviewing somebody from South Africa in a week or so about xenophobia and I was like well there's even a sh social fiction about that I should hurry up and read it oh I'll send you a copy so I'm ready you know you, you'll have to let me know your, your address when we're off the air and I'd happily send you a copy but that's a beautiful book and here's an example that's a professor uh, in Canada Tara Goldstein who wrote three plays that are all based on real events and she researched those events heavily yeah. and created these plays. But the idea is that, it, you know, they're enjoyable just to read as plays, but that it leaves you with issues to think about. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really important, you know, some of us can relate personally to the events in the books, but if you can't relate personally, the idea is to understand perspective of somebody else. Mm -hmm. What is somebody else's life like, and how might you see something about that that you didn't see before? So, you know, she's done a great job with those plays. I actually was lucky enough to fly to Toronto for the launch of her book, and she um, had a theater group who enacted a part of one of the plays. So I got to see it live, and it was extraordinary. That's arts-based research in action, huh? Yeah, at its best, right? Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you. I would enjoy that, too. I was planning to order it. Oh, no, no, no. I'll send it to you. My pleasure. Even better. Even better. I know the editor. <laughs> so, I want to squ switch gears a little bit and ask you, it's kind of a fun question, but I also think it's a really neat question from an empowerment standpoint. Mm. If you could go back in time and give your 18-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? Okay, I absolutely love that question. Um, and I think in some ways, you know, it really ties into what we're talking about because I think I think when I first wrote Low Fat Love, in some ways it was to offer that very advice to, to you know, women who are 18, in their 20s, in their 30s, any age, but certainly young women. Um, you know, I think that a common answer to that question would be to be kinder to yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that's what a lot of people would say. Yeah. But this is what I would say. I would say if I could say anything to my 18-year-old self, it would be light your own fire. You don't need external validation from a guy yes. or friends. Cultivate your own interests and talents. Build an identity that is based on work you care about mm -hmm. so that you become a whole person yourself and you have something to offer others. Um, and I think when you do that, when you develop an identity that's based on work you're engaged in, based on something you're interested in, a social issue, mm -hmm. a creative art, whatever it might be, then actually what happens is you do become kinder to yourself yeah. because you're not so busy chasing the approval of someone else. 
you know, whether it's a guy, a professor, a parent, a girl, it doesn't matter who it is. Instead of doing that, you have something that makes you feel good about yourself, that you can draw from, that's not dependent on anyone else, that gives you a self-esteem boost, that makes you feel empowered. And I think when you have that, you inevitably become kinder to yourself. You know, you just do. You do. Yeah, and I mean, when I was 18, I have to say, you know, I, I was in many ways a complete mess, and I was absolutely seeking external validation in a whole range of ways. Um, and one of those ways was, you know, finding a relationship with somebody who, you know, was interesting or talented or successful or something that I was attracted to at that time. Yeah. Instead of thinking, you know, gee, maybe I should work on becoming interesting, talented, successful, yeah. something for myself. And of course, when you do that, what happens is you find other people like that. You naturally gravitate towards, towards other folks who are like that. I think that's the best answer to that question I've heard yet. It, it really is. And finding validation on an internal level, I think, is one of the top five life skills that you need to be happy. And to know that at 18 would be monumental. I know uh, I didn't. No, I think most of us don't. But to anyone who happens to be watching this, mm -hmm. I mean, once you have the idea planted in your head, you can start thinking about it. And I have to say, I mean, Amy Lee, when I read your book, uh, it is the only dating book I've ever read cover to cover, but I did not read it for dating advice. I mean, I was not seeking dating advice. To me, a spiritual girl's guide to dating is about empowerment. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, it's really a life philosophy, and dating is one form of that, but it's a life philosophy. And to me, it's the same thing. I mean, one of the messages I got from your book, um, like I have from the work of many other women I respect, mm -hmm. is light your own fire. You know, exactly. you have to come work from a position of strength, and in order to do that, you need to build yourself up from the inside out. That's the only way to do it. It doesn't matter who's on your arm or any of that other sort of stuff or what anybody else says about your work. Um, you have to do it from the inside out. I agree. I agree, and thank you. I'm glad to hear that you felt that way about the book. It was kind of indirectly my letter to my former self as well. You know, all the things we wish we knew back when we were younger, but we didn't, but we learned them, and... It, and now, it, it, now you're paying it forward. So yeah. now you're helping others learn it at whatever age they might be at. I love when I get emails from women, young women, you know, in their early 20s who like the book and are practicing it. I'm just like, oh, that's so awesome to hear that because they got to get to that point so much sooner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Exactly. But it's never too late. Nope, never too late. Someone is, you know, the younger you are, the better. And I say that as the mother of a teenage daughter. Mm -hmm. I have a 14-year-old daughter, and I think, you know, gosh, if she can learn any of these lessons earlier, she'll just have more time to be happy. I mean, I really think that's what it is, more time to be happy mm -hmm. and engaged and productive. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my hope for her. But I also feel like, you know, it's never too late. I've, I've interviewed women in their 70s who are learning those lessons now and they're putting them to good use. Yeah. So more power to them. I agree. I had a client years ago in her 60s learning that and it was a beautiful, beautiful thing to witness how that was changing everything for the better. Yeah. Because it really does. It really does. Yeah. It really does. Thank you for that great advice. Uh, so the next question is always fun to ask people. And it is, what is your greatest joy in life? Well, I have many. I mean, life itself, but for fear of sounding corny, it is the truth. Life itself is a joy. And I think once you realize time is not unlimited, yes. you try and get what you can out of every moment. Yes. Um, if I had to pick one thing from throughout my life, I would say writing, because for me, Writing is a well that never runs dry, just insofar as it's something I can go to to feel good that takes no one else. Um, I don't need anything special. I could have a napkin and a pen or a pencil. I don't need anything fancy. It doesn't require the involvement or approval of any other people, and it just makes me feel good. So I would definitely say writing, but I mean, there are many other things that bring me joy. My family, my friends, my dogs. 
walks on the beach. I live in southern Maine, and if you want to feel better, going for a walk on the beach is always a good thing. Uh, you know, even a good meal. And I love the arts, so going to a concert, seeing a film, going to a dance show, all of that. But if I was forced to pick one thing, yeah. I pick writing, and um, I love that the thing that brings me joy is something that I can do all by my lonesome. Yes, I feel that way too about writing, and I love that no matter what's going on, good or bad in life, when we take to whether it's the computer or a notebook or whatever it might be to write, for me, it transports me somewhere that I want to be, you know, and it helps me feel empowered because I'm creating a world or I'm creating a work that A, I can share, but really B, it's about the creating. I think that's so beautifully put because it is a way to transport yourself, mm -hmm. to shift your mood and shift where you are mentally without having to leave your chair. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something about the creative process in general because I have a lot of friends who are different kinds of artists, so musicians, mm -hmm. dancers, whatever it is. I think there's something about knowing you're creating yeah. uh, or co-creating depending on how you look at the mm -hmm. creative process. But I think it's very empowering. And I also think, you know, like writing is the only thing I spend time doing where sometimes I forget to have lunch. You know, yeah. all of a sudden I, I literally hear my stomach growling and I look at the, the time and I'm like, oh my God, how is it two or three in the afternoon I haven't eaten? Because you lose track of time. And to me, that means, you know, you're really engaged in your passion. Which really goes back to your first question about what's my favorite part of my career. Yeah. I mean, that I'm so privilege and it is a true privilege to be able to spend my time doing something I'm passionate about, I love, I have the freedom to do it. It's just an incredible blessing. I agree. I feel the same way. So our final question is, it's a catch-all for a lot of the work that you do that I really admire. And it is, uh, with society and culture and its current state, do you think we should all be feminists? Absolutely. A resounding yes. I need my hands for that answer. Yes. Um, you know, and it's, it's a simple and a complicated answer. I mean, the simple part is every human being deserves the right to live their best life. Yes. Period. Um, and for that to happen, it requires physical and psychological safety mm -hmm. and equal access to opportunities and resources. Um, and, and there's so much injustice, and there's so many different examples of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll give you just a couple like quick little examples, but before I do that, I just want to be clear that when I talk about feminism and when I talk mm -hmm. about my feminist agenda, um, obviously I'm talking about equality for girls and for women, but for everybody. Yeah. I'm thinking of all those who are disenfranchised and marginalized, all those who are excluded. So I'm thinking about transgendered persons. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about people marginalized for their sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about racial minorities. I think that we all need to be advocates and allies for everybody. If not for the simple purpose that who's going to be your advocate, who's going to be your ally, if you're in a position of inequality. Um, but just a couple of examples to show why we need feminism. You know, go online and look at any story about Hillary Clinton, for example, and our campaign for president. Now, this has nothing to do with politics whatsoever. Uh -huh. It doesn't matter if you like her. It doesn't matter if you're going to vote for her. But why are there so many hateful and overtly sexist comments throughout social media on Huffington Post articles, you name it, about what she looks like, her physical appearance, her wardrobe, her age. They're, they're meant to demean her, obviously. Yeah. On top of which, there are outright threats online about violence towards her. Yeah. But, you know, you don't need to be running for president in this country for us to see that. You know, go on Twitter any day of the week, and often if women are expressing something um, political, they are attacked, sometimes threatened with sexual violence. I mean, really stop and think about it. There's obviously rampant inequality, otherwise mm -hmm. that wouldn't exist. But I'll just give you a different kind of example just personally from my last week. I mentioned to you before we were on the air that last week I was at a major conference, mm -hmm. the American Educational Research Association Conference in Chicago. And I was there for five days. 
Uh, it's over 14,000 people, so it's a massive academic conference. Mm -hmm. And this year the theme was social justice. Okay, so one of the reasons I was there was to deliver a keynote address in my field of qualitative and arts-based research. So obviously I'm there based on professional credentials, but I have to tell you, there were many remarks made to my face about my appearance. Mm -hmm. So about the fact that I have long hair, that I wear makeup, the kinds of clothes I wear, that I'm quote-unquote feminine. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I really find that amazing. And those are only the comments made to my face. There is no context in which a white straight man who is giving a keynote speech at a conference would have a discussion about his clothing. It just wouldn't happen. It's masculine. Absolutely. It just wouldn't happen. And just to be clear, I don't think it's anything about my appearance in particular. I think if I was a woman who had no makeup and short hair, there'd be a discussion about my appearance too. It would just be a different discussion. So I think that, you know, all women face that. And then one other example, because I mentioned before it's important that we're all advocates and allies, and I think it's important we're advocates and allies for all those groups who are disenfranchised, not just the group we happen to be a member of. Mm -hmm. So my favorite thing that I did at that five-day conference was actually not my own talk, but I went to see a keynote address by a brilliant scholar, Dr. Donna Ford, who I've admired for years, but I've never met in person before. She was a part of a three-person panel, but she was doing the major keynote. Um, and in essence, her presentation was about racism in academic research and publishing. Mm -hmm. And her, her keynote, I mean, talk about sold out. Not only was every seat taken, but they were bringing in folding chairs in the back, right. and people were literally standing against the walls. Not everyone who wanted to be in that room could get into that room. That being said, I was one of a handful of white people in that room. I could probably count on the fingers on one hand how many white people were in that room. And while I'm not responsible for anyone but myself, I have to say I was mortified. Um, because where are the advocates and allies? What she was talking about is something that everybody at that conference should be interested in. Now, I realize 14,000 people could not make her session. Other people were doing things. Sure. But it was very telling and revealing to me yeah. that there were only a handful of white folks. And actually, I happened to be sitting next to a colleague who's a Facebook friend who I had never met before. Um, so we, you know, we're like, oh, my God, we're Facebook friends. And that colleague said it was the exact same thing at conferences for gay and lesbian and transgender rights. Wow. and queer theory conferences, yeah. that where are the straight people? Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. So, you know, when we talk about mm -hmm. feminism, we're really talking about equality and injustice for all those who are marginalized. So, you know, as a woman, I feel it's important to speak up on behalf of girls and women, mm -hmm. but I feel like it's important to speak up on behalf of all those that I am aware are disenfranchised, mm -hmm. are marginalized, do face systematic injustices. So, you know, I, I would encourage anybody out there listening to think about, you know, wouldn't you want someone standing up for you? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you want someone standing up for your child, for your loved ones? And it, it's just important that everybody has an equal opportunity to self-actualize, which is something that you write about. It's about becoming the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think we're not all put on equal playing ground to become the best version of ourselves. And we all have responsibility in fighting that. I agree, and I love you bringing it up from the standpoint of wouldn't you want someone to advocate for you if you were in those shoes? I mean, it, for someone like me, it's hard for me to not think that at times. Like, oh my gosh, what would it be like to be that other person? I almost over-identify. And perhaps that's a good thing because we really need to be looking at that on a larger scale. I totally agree. I think that's a really wonderful way to put it. Thank you. Yeah. I remember when Hillary Clinton ran the first time during the New Hampshire primary, I lived there. And um, a friend of mine was her makeup artist and for the first time. And she made her look very nice. You know, should be just a regular day. And I remember being astounded that for days in local and national media, 
Every story about Hillary was about her lipstick. Nobody cared what she said at that debate. It was the debate in New Hampshire. They cared about what makeup she wore. Were they talking about that with any of the other male candidates? Of course they weren't. I just remember being struck by that so viscerally. It was obviously something I'd been aware of anyways, but being like, wow, this is still a major issue. Absolutely. And make no mistake, I mean, as I'm sure you agree, it is an attempt to undermine her. It is an attempt to not engage with the issues she's talking about. It's an, it's an attempt to undermine her. And by doing so, it's an attempt to undermine all girls and women. I agree. And, you know, we are behind in this country. I know that we often think we're ahead of the curve, but certainly when it comes to political representation and gender, we are way behind. Agreed. Way behind. And um, again, I think, you know, what happens to one woman happens to us all in some respect, insofar as if we don't stand up and say no. It doesn't matter whether or not I happen to like Hillary Clinton. Right. Uh, it has nothing to do with that. We, it's not her we're defending. It's the idea that a political candidate, we shouldn't be discussing their lipstick. Right. We shouldn't be discussing their makeup and their hair. It's absolutely irrelevant. I agree. And I think in our culture, it's a, it's a complicated issue because we're socialized, even, you know, award season dresses and all of the mainstream media stuff around that. And yet, as women, I don't think there's anything wrong with enjoying our femininity, enjoying makeup, enjoying clothes, enjoying the art that we can, you know, have fun with and things like that. So I think we have kind of a strange divide because, in my opinion, if we start personally, like I try to start, and don't look at someone for how they look. Yes, you can appreciate I love that outfit everything but listen you know think about ideas don't don't look at a woman first based on her appearance because we don't do that with men no we, I mean, we certainly don't evaluate them in their professions yes. um, in, in you know competitive hobbies we, we don't do any of that in terms of their appearance we do it in terms of their performance yes. and it's interesting because when we focus on women's appearance there is the possibility of disrupting their performance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, certainly I'm not on Hillary Clinton's stage, but just from my own small little stage, I can tell you, when you're walking into a room to deliver a keynote speech and people are talking about your hair, makeup, or shoes, it is very disruptive. Yeah. So am I then going to deliver my very best speech? Right. I don't know. Um, but I know that no man would face that. Certainly no straight white man would face that sort of critique based on his appearance. I so I think it's really important. And I also think, you know, in your comment, I agree with you, you're sort of looking at a damned if you do and damned if you don't. You are. So, you know, it's, it just shows you women can't win as long as the culture remains sexist. Exactly. Because if you happen to look feminine, if you enjoy makeup, have long hair, those kinds of things, you're critiqued for that. Mm -hmm. If you don't, if that's not your aesthetic, you don't wear makeup, you have short hair, uh, and that sort of thing, you're critiqued for that. Yeah. So it shows you it's not really about you know how you choose to present yourself, it's really about the fact that you're female. I mean, that's, that's really the problem, right? You're something other than white, straight male. Yeah. And, and I have to say, that should be an issue for all honorable white straight men. I agree. Uh, for those men who you know work hard and have integrity, they should advocate for equality and justice. Uh, I, agree. I, I mean, they should be allies. They should be advocates. Uh, if if they don't want to be on an unfair playing field, then they have every reason to speak up. And I certainly know many men many white straight men who are wonderful advocates who would call yes, themselves feminists and, and I believe are. So it's it's not a gender issue. But I think some men think I can't be feminist because I'm a man. Right. And simply untrue. I mean if you believe in justice and equality, yes. if you would want your son or daughter to have same life chances, same opportunities, yes. the same uh, freedom from 
physical violence, from psychological abuse. <laughs> if you would want that, you too can be feminist. Yeah. It's simply about your belief system and how you enact that in the world. It's just about equality. I mean, to go back to the simplest answer, it's just like, do you think people should be treated fairly? Yes or no? I think that's a really great way to put it. What a great interview. We could talk for hours about these topics. <laughs> we really could. We really could. We talked before we started rolling, and I'm sure we'll talk after. No doubt. I, I can't thank you enough for this. It's such great fun. I absolutely love your show. Yeah. And, uh, I, I mean, I just, I could talk to you for hours. Likewise. Likewise. And we could talk to you guys for hours, but we know you've got places to go, people to see, so we're going to wrap it up. So thank you so much for being here, Patricia. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. And thank you all for watching. Remember to live joy, be kind, and love unconditionally today and every day.